I thank you all for coming here. The subject I'm going to talk about today is what can we learn from Iraq and that really allows me to talk about just about anything. And before I start, uh, I've listed three kind of categories of conflict up there. The first one, Cambodia and Somalia, Australia's involvement in those two was fundamentally peacekeeping and we're going back a fair few years now. And they were fundamentally different to our involvement in Bougainville, the Solomon Islands and East Timor. Uh, we were peacekeeping here. In, the Bo in Bougainville, we weren't, our troops weren't even armed. So they were performing uh, a very, very interesting military type of task. In the Solomon Islands, the Australian Federal Police were leading and a civilian was bossing up the organisation and behind it sat uh, a military organisation. And in East Timor, we all know the history of T East Timor, uh, of violence, uh, 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 an agreement with the Indonesians, a UN-sanctioned activity, in we went, but not a high amount of violence. And the third kind of category is Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, big international operations, religiously inspired opponents, counterinsurgency, uh, and an awful lot of violence. Now, there are different kinds of conflicts. And our societies and the militaries from our society must be able to cover all the different kinds of conflict that there is a probability of us as a society become involved, becoming involved in. Now, the one I put down the bottom there, the Franco-Prussian War, I always use that as an example because I can never think of the actual date of it, 1870-something. Now, I don't care if we forget the lessons of the Franco-Prussian War. I could not care less. But when we forget the lessons of Iraq, which is still running and we fail to apply them to Afghanistan, I think that it's extraordinarily important that as a society we look at ourselves, we look at our political leaders and we look at the directions that they give to their military. You're going to have to cut me a bit of slack here because I'm going to go into a, before I actually break down the presentation, I'm going to offer you a number of generalisations. And uh, they really are savage generalisations. If you want to get sophisticated and nuanced, we can do it uh, as we go through in the question time. But give me a little bit of slack here and I'll put these propositions to you in a general form. Then I'll get into the formal part. And at the end of it, you can say to yourself, well, in the, of the generalisations, did he generally explain why he thought the generalisations were interesting? Before I go into the generalisations, I want to address... Uh, a, a moral issue that I normally address in great detail when I speak only about my involvement in the Iraq war. Uh, no soldier can ignore the morality or the ethics of, of warfare. And of course, if you uh, become involved in a war which you don't consider unjust, which you don't consider just, you can find yourself uh, uh, answering to higher authorities, be it your own government, be it to the judiciary, judicial system, or be it in the most extreme to the ICC. Uh, I've got to say in my own defence, I did not invade Iraq. Okay, you can blame me for a lot of things, but I didn't invade Iraq. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, I thought, as did 90% of the people involved in the preparation for and the conduct of the invasion of Iraq, that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. And a significant proportion of the people now who say, I told you that they didn't have weapons of mass destruction, were awfully silent at the time. Even, even Saddam's generals thought that he had weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> However, uh, I think that you can make a case that the invasion was, was legal. It may not have been all that smart, but I think you can make a case that the invasion was legal. Uh, in, in its smartness, it probably relates to something like the strategic error of Gallipoli. However, that was not the problem that faced me. I didn't invade Iraq. I went to the counterinsurgency that followed Iraq. I don't believe there is a war in Iraq. There are a series of wars in Iraq. Uh, uh, for all the Americans' faults, they believed that they would be going home in 90 days after the, uh, after the invasion for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, 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 but that, in my view, that's a different issue. I believe that we had a moral, a high moral obligation once we'd invaded Iraq to put it back together again. And that's the war that I went to. I went to the counterinsurgency that followed the invasion of Iraq. And I believe 
that that in itself was a just war. We busted it, we had to put it back together. Now we've paid 4,000 casualties, nearly 5,000 casualties in that, and the Iraqis of course have paid a lot more casualties. But that's the situation and that's the ethical decision that I have to make. Let me, and I'm, you're more than welcome, uh, and I'm sure you realise it, to take it up uh, any other moral or ethical issues you'd like to take up during question time. But we're talking about Iraq as it applies to Afghanistan, our current conflict, and let me start with a couple of generalisations. The first one is that it is much harder to withdraw your troops from a conflict than it is to decide to not get into it in the first case. So when we talk about the conflict that we are now in, that's a big factor. We can all list reasons why we, might, why we should be in Afghanistan or why we shouldn't be in Afghanistan. The fact of the matter is that we are there and a range of implications uh, grow in importance if we have to then pull our troops out. Now, it looks like the Dutch may do it, it looks like the Canadians may do it and it'll be very interesting uh, to see what the implications strategically for them are. The next generalisation is that a comprehensive interagency approach, it's not just a set of words. It's real resources in terms, as I say there, time, money, lives and reputation. Now, I put that one up there because as a humane and good society, we don't like war. And we search every other uh, policy option to try and avoid war. And we seem to come up continually in Canberra, which is where I come from, with the answer being we've got to have a comprehensive interagency approach. Uh, and that's as far as it goes. And the military, under-equipped, under-resourced, with no capacity to deliver masses of, of, of humanitarian aid, to advise on governance or to tell people how to get rid of the poppies, finds themselves doing exactly the same thing before we came up with this great comprehensive interagency approach. There's got to, be a, uh, there's got to be a matching between the tasks that the government takes, the resources that they allocate to those tasks, and the way those tasks and resources fit into the overall Obama strategy for a place like Afghanistan. The next generalisation is that end states are fantastic as an academic exercise. When we all uprighteously demand the government provide an end state for what it's doing, that's fantastic. It won't last, it won't last a millisecond. Because the act of becoming involved in a conflict immediately changes the nature of the conflict. And you could find something Clausewitzian about that. Uh, but I, I suggest to you, by all means, Demand an end state, accept the end state the government then gives you and accept it to have absolutely no relevance. Uh, I always say troops rather than security forces. By security forces I mean troops, police, uh, uh, field force, all the kind of uh, organisations in a country that, you, that either exist or you're building to achieve security. So I say that troops are not the only answer but they are normally the first answer. And that's an important point. Because everyone says to us, and I used to get offered an extraordinary amount of unsolicited advice in Iraq about how to win, uh, people always say there is no military solution. Well, of course there's not. No one ever said there was. People have known there's been no military solution since the British dropped bombs on the Iraqis in the 20s. There is no military solution. Um, but before you do the clever parts of counterinsurgency, that is governance, uh, economic, uh, 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 rule of law, all the clever parts of counterinsurgency, you've got to establish somewhere across the country some level of security. Now, if, of course, the enemy give up and immediately negotiate with you and uh, obey the rule of law and join the government, you've got a Solomon Islands situation. That's fantastic. The situation I'm talking about is where an enemy is actually opposing you. So, they're not the only answer but they are normally the first answer because you must establish a level of security before you can do the clever parts of counterinsurgency. So counterinsurgencies are not quick, cheap or easy. We bitch and mumble about the length of time of the fight in Iraq, but at the moment it's two years short of being an average counterinsurgency. Two years short of being an average counterinsurgency. It doesn't make it a good counterinsurgency or, or less people being killed. It just means that we must have some perspective. 
at the moment we complain that, that Afghanistan has now been running since 2001. So it's now eight years into its running. Uh, I only think it's th this particular phase of Afghan's troubled last two or three hundred years of conflict is only two years old. And really, for the Americans, it's only one year old <laughs> this year. So, and that gives you a different approach because you learn wars by doing them. And uh, I'd like to suggest that when we look at the policy aspects of any conflict, that we avoid the three standard errors that every government makes every time we involve in conflict. And the first one is we always allocate insufficient security forces to begin with. Guaranteed, laid down, you can't name me a war where it didn't happen. The second one is we then insist because we're good moral people. We then insist that reconstruction start now. We've got troops over there, why aren't they reconstructing stuff? Again, that's fantastic, but until you establish security, you are wasting your time trying to do reconstruction. And then we fail to provide even the non-military resources. If we think we may not have enough troops in Afghanistan, we don't have enough political officers, governance officers, agricultural officers. Uh, we've probably got enough electoral officers now because we're building up to an election in, uh, very, very soon. Uh, the, 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 the real solid failure of every one of our recent activities is the non-military components of what our society puts into these, into these struggles. And the last, uh, I think it's the last one, uh, avoid simple solutions, they are sure to be wrong, particularly simple generalisations. They're sure to be wrong. I heard a Dutch Socialist Party representative speaking on the radio this morning, you may have heard it, Radio National I think it was, who was advocating that the problem with Afghanistan is the presence of foreign troops. Remove the foreign troops and the problem goes away. Now he's forgotten how bad the Taliban was, but we're all capable of doing that. When Fran Kelly asked him the obvious question, but what about the civil war that may break out afterwards? His answer was simplistic and naive. Well, it may happen, we don't know what's going to happen. So he's pre he is advocating that you and I follow a policy in a war that we have got ourselves into, which morally and ethically we have some responsibility, to pull our troops out if there is a 1% probability of that society tearing itself to bits, our Dutch socialist is happy with that. Now I thought socialism was naive, but he's carrying that into a political dimension that just blows me away. Now, having disobeyed the second last law, get serious or get out. Now we can't really get out. Uh, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get out and we can kind of not do anything more. This is Australia and, and the West. We can not do much more. But every time you don't try to achieve a decisive result in these conflicts, you extend the conflict and who pays the price? The people. So I think I'm just about ready to start the presentation. Now I'll, I'll break it into three parts. I'll try and give you a model of Australia's conflicts because it's difficult enough to understand the logic of what, we, what our governments do with the military as they become involved in these conflicts if you don't, if you don't have an overall understanding of, of, of what I think is the model of Australia's conflicts. I'll then talk for a little bit about operations in Iraq and then I'll bring it back to Afghanistan. Uh, I like to try and search for a model of Australia's conflicts firstly from our strategic guidance. We are a distinct middle power. Unlike Canada, uh, we're not like uh, a number of the middle power NATO countries who don't ever do anything out of NATO. We do have the responsibility given to us by government to do things independently within our own area of responsibility. So what I'm searching for is a distinct middle power approach to military art in general and operational art in particular. And by operational art, what I mean is the best use of your resources in a conflict situation. What a general, whether he's a civilian or a military general, actually does. And the model of conflict I, I've, I've come up with is pretty standard and it derives its words not directly from the last white paper, but those sentiments are in there, but from previous strategic guidance. The first half of the model is that the Australian Defence Force must be a security provider. So we are required by government to send our troops overseas pretty well 
at the tactical level, and by tactical I mean write down small numbers of troops doing bottom level tactical type things, anywhere in the globe, so the commitment is global, probably, in, always really, in an alliance, uh, and a lot of people refer to this as niche. So this is, our, this is us being a security provider. We choose to do these activities. These are what is generally called missions of choice and the reasons we do them is to show commitment. Now, you'll notice the one thing that's missing and that is to win. And I'll get, I'll get back to that in a second. So that's the first half of the model and it's an, we're, we're in an extraordinary position in, in Australia in this situation because our missions of choice mean that we can choose the war if we don't like the war, we don't go. If we're not ready for the war, we'll say, well, we won't come this year, we'll come next year, we'll get ready. We can choose the time of our involvement. So if our troops aren't ready this month, we can, we can get them ready over a six-month period and send them in six months' time. We can choose the force levels we send. If we don't have many troops, we can send a small number of troops. We can choose the area of operations within the war. Uh, and within that area of operations, we can choose the type of operations that we conduct. So if we don't want to incur casualties, we can conduct very restricted operations or no offensive operations at all. And of course, we can choose the time to go home. And this is a, a triumph of Australian diplomacy. There's no two ways about it. And it's the Defence Force's bread and butter, and I think we do it very, very well. Uh, will this occur forever? Well, I don't know. Uh, if you read the last white paper, uh, which is going to spend vast amounts of money on preparing for state-on-state -state conflict, and if you believe that, uh, then God bless you. But uh, certainly we, we have to prepare for a range of things. So this is our mission of choice. That's what we choose. And this is where we come back to the second half of the model. So the first half of the model was a security provider. The second half of the model is a as a, the Australian Defence Force as a security leader. Now, that's the model that to me explains the fact that on occasions uh, 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 we may have to do a generational war that we have to win, but most of the time what we do is we do missions of choice. We've got to do both of them very, very well. The lessons from the missions of choice where you, if it gets tough, you have the choice of stop, stopping to fight. Those kind of lessons may be very different from lessons uh, in a mission of necessity where you actually have to win. But that's a problem which mainly the military has to manage, but our society, I believe, should be aware of that. 